to the Neuro Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Joe, here with my guest, Dr. Mark Ellis. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm super excited. Me too. Um, so the topic of uh, discussion today, I'm, I was really excited about. Um, it's a unique topic in that we want to pair the world of neurology and how that relates to uh, various martial arts, correct? Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So for, before we get too deeply into that, you're obviously an expert in, well, for those who don't know, you're an expert in both fields, really. How did you uh, become, how did you, I guess, gain your interest in the two and how have you paired those two in life? Well, I, I was a, a kid in New Jersey. And so martial arts was the coolest thing. You know, we had Kung Fu theater and, you know, like so many young kids, you're influenced by it. And then I started practicing it and I, I, I just fell in love with it. And I've spent hours and hours and hours of training. And then I wanted to go to what I think is maybe a more advanced level of the martial arts, which is instead of learning to fight and defend yourself and, and all these things is, and then, and then there's an aspect of martial arts, which is about your personal self healing and everything. And then there's another aspect of the martial arts, which is, how to help other people heal. So in, in um, the early martial arts, a lot of the martial artists were the healers. And so in my system, which is called Saji Do, I wanted to expand the healing aspect of the art. So then I went to, I was gonna go to chiropractic first, but I went to massage first and I started to learn massage therapy. And when I was there, all the things that we were doing with pressure points and joint locks and flipping people, I was taking the massage information and I was integrating it. And I was able to like find better where people were hurt. Uh, and because I was really good at hitting the pressure points and then I learned to heal them and get them better. And then I went to chiropractic school. I think chiropractic school is amazing because you learn all the anatomy and physiology and all the, things about medicine and healthcare that are and from a healthcare perspective that are important. And then you learn how to fix every joint in the body. And then um, I became a, a student of uh, Professor Ted Carrick and I learned about neurology and brain rehab. And it fascinated me because brain, re brain rehab and learning how the brain works answers so many questions about how the body works. And so then I was, I kept integrating all this martial arts, massage work, chiropractic work in with brain rehab. And, and I would take paralyzed patients. And because I had spent so much time learning how to um, flip a person through the air or how to teach a person to do a spinning kick, I, I had really good biomechanics understanding. And I would translate that into stroke rehab and neuro rehab and vestibular rehab and i kept compiling that information and then um i studied a lot about concussions i, I reverse engineered it a little bit too where got a little bit better at figuring out how to do martial arts to um you know maybe knock somebody out or something like that so i just kept integrating all of it through my life uh, and that's been well that's been about 35 years now and uh, yeah, you brought up uh, finding pressure points in uh, in martial arts, which is one of the you know things you're looking for, I assume. And you're finding uh, where you can assert your leverage uh, as well. And it sounds like you've been able to translate that into clinical practice with massage and chiropractic, and and really figure out how to if you can find out where it breaks, you can find out how to heal it too. I assume. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now I think that's a better service. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, in the long run, for sure. Um, so there's obviously a lot of different types of martial arts, um, and they all require different movements. Um, the one I'm familiar with is Tai Chi the most. That's what I've, uh, I've done a little bit of that. But obviously that varies 
greatly with jujitsu and uh, some of these other styles uh, that require different types of body movements. How, how do those play into uh, this whole neurology aspect? So from a, a brain perspective, different ones have different, I think, strengths and advantages. So for instance, if you're looking at Tai Chi, Tai, there's, well, there's, there's five different classic families of Tai Chi. Most people are the most familiar with Yang style, and it's really about your health. Um, there's a, um, Chen style, which is an older one. It's a little more martial arts based uh, in, in terms of fighting. But with Tai Chi, you have these very slow, deliberate, coordinated movements, and you activate parts of your brain related to interoception. And you learn to get this amazing breath control and learn to control your heart rate. And you, you might take a minute or two to put your foot down and translate your weight. So there's research out there that shows it's fantastic for balance and improving the health within your balance system. But then if you take, say, a different art like, um, say, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, in that one, you have a lot of uh, touch receptors that you're activating because you're wrestling with the person. So you have to get a different body awareness, but you have to connect your body awareness to your partner. So it becomes about the inner relationship to your world, and it begins to activate parts of your brain that really help you to understand how you're inter interrelating to other people. From a martial arts perspective, you're trying to get around and maybe choke them or something. Mm -hmm. But from, from a neurophysiological perspective, you're getting this amazing uh, sense of how somebody's moving around you and how that relates to you, and then how do you move to influence them? And particularly as, a, as an instructor, uh, then you, know, you really have to build these other higher cognitive elements of you know, teaching and creating friendly environments. These are some things people don't think about that when they put their child into martial arts to maybe help them, they don't realize that later as that child becomes a teacher that they learn to create a healthy environment for people to learn and to be safe. Mm -hmm. Then you get, some, you get some other ones where you get a little superhuman, you know, how many concrete boards can you break? And you, you have to learn this internal power. And then one of the ones that I think is really fascinating is when you do weapons training. So we have these body maps of who we are and how we are in space. But when you hold a weapon, you actually map the weapon as part of yourself. Or when you hold a tool, like a mm -hmm. screwdriver or a hammer, if people are really good at building a house, they go one hit or something, they, they know where the hammer is and where the nail is. Well, with weapons, you really expand your perceived circle and you get very, very, very fast, particularly if you do where you train, where you have a weapon and you're fighting somebody with a weapon. Then that relationship like the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it gets very fast, especially if it's dangerous, like in knife fighting. Um, you get an extremely heightened awareness of where you are and where they are and how to move correctly. And your body maps are uh, shifting based on the weapons. And um, that converts into taking your own internal self-awareness and activating your frontal lobe so that you become better at uh, problem solving and social interactions and how to translate that because of its impact on the executive functioning regions of your brain. Yeah, interesting. Um, so what type of patient would you say would benefit from maybe this jujitsu style where it's focusing on kind of this I guess, peripersonal space and uh, their surroundings. Uh, what, what's an example of a patient that might benefit from uh, pursuing well, that? I'd, I'd rather switch that a little bit because jujitsu yeah. is, is so hard on the body. I mean, that's one of the highest injury rates uh, and things like that. But for, like for kids with uh, learning disabilities, if they're in 
different types of karate or taekwondo or one of those classes where they line up and then they learn how to line up and follow directions and discipline themselves. And then um, they have to do, you know, there's all these exercises that you're super familiar with where you're doing left, right integration. Well, in martial arts, they're very complicated because you're doing, you know, like in the karate kid, you know, wax on, wax off. Well, you have to move your arms and integrate the left side of your body with the right side of the body and integrate your arms and your legs. And it begins to get the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain to integrate together, to focus. So I like uh, for those kids, maybe those types of classes, like sort of the traditional thing that people think of, whereas particularly for the elderly, something like Tai Chi is really amazing for their balance and uh, blood, keeping their blood pressure healthy and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then on the, the reverse side of that, uh, before I forget this question, um, if you had somebody who was trying to perfect a martial art, uh, maybe it's Taekwondo or, you know, uh, Tai Chi, but they couldn't get the movements right due to uh, maybe some neurological imbalances. What are some ways we, we can flip it and then address it neurologically to help the, uh, the martial art? Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, number one, this is sort of funny as people tend to follow patterns. There was one grandmaster came up to my martial arts instructor, uh, his name's Jim Sams, and he said, uh, Grandmaster Sams, all your students punch differently. And my teacher said, all my students are different people. So I think the highest philosophical level of martial arts is uh, how do you do it for yourself? You know, not that we all have to look the same in this giant line, but um, from a, a chiropractic neurology perspective, or if I don't know if you like to call it functional neurology, if somebody runs into a, a problem, so for instance, um, I, I have a, 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 an autistic uh, patient right now, and she's trying to do a roundhouse kick on her left leg, and she's actually okay with it, but when she tries to do it on her right leg, she doesn't do it so well. Well, people think, oh, well, you're kicking with your right leg, and you're balancing with your left leg, and, and that's your problem, but when I watched her, what happens is she had this vestibular disorder, so when she would go with one side, her head would be turning to the left. Mm -hmm. But when she went to the other one, her head was turning to the right. Yeah. And when her neck turned to the right, she got a balance disorder and she could not progress past like orange belt. So what I did was I did the vestibular rehab techniques that we're all really familiar with. And I integrated her eye and her neck and her inner ear with her body. And she could do those kicks. And I think uh, you know, she's a second degree black belt now, which is amazing. And then as she would go along, because she had these, these different um, challenges, she would go in and I would give her different um, rehab exercises over the years to help her overcome each one of those challenges. Um, and again, I think that's where some of the work we do is so cool because we know how to really look at the person as an individual and then mm -hmm. solve that problem for them and help them with whatever you know their life goals are. But that's the big thing. You look at it and it was amazing. I mean, she just couldn't, she couldn't turn her head that way to do it, to do the move. Every single move she had like that, she would fall over. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. And do you find, I know that uh, with dancers, sometimes they uh, kind of, uh, with the vestibular pathways, they kind of uh, inhibit them eventually uh, because they do spin so often. Uh, yeah. Do you see that at all with uh, you know various types of uh, yeah. uh, martial well, arts? I, I remember when I was first going, we do the, the optokinetic stimulation. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of time training with vision. We have foveal vision and non-foveal vision and the foveal vision is more interrelated to newer parts of your brain and that acute uh, uh, targeting and the non-foveal vision or people are familiar with the peripheral vision you look at everything all, all at once 
-hmm. And so when, when you would train, you do different things. So I spent a lot of time learning to observe the entirety of my world with every sense I could. And so I would do this non-foveal vision. Well, this, the guy comes up to me with the optokinetic tape and he goes, hey, look at this. And my eyes didn't move at all because in martial arts, if people are moving at you, you don't want to react to each one. You don't want to saccade to every target that's happening. That's, that's the whole thing is to faint and then hit the guy. So, so the dude looks at me, he goes, man, your, your brain's really messed up. You know, what, what are you talking about? I'm looking at everything. I'm not going to follow each one of those stripes. So each one of those arts, like dance or something has different ways that you modulate internal reflexes within your brain and you plasticize your brain differently based on the art. And some of those have more benefits uh, in different psychosocial environments than, than others might. But yeah, you have to override different reflexes. So uh, long-term, do, uh, do you find that that causes problems down the road or is that something that is okay for that individual? You know, I think that whether it's going to cause problems or be okay for them depends. So for instance, mm -hmm. that vestibular override, I, I don't think that's a problem at all because when you look at movement, there's, there's the one concept of movement that movement is based on the sensory stimuli within your world and that the way that what you see and what you do causes you to move. But there's another concept where you're just dictating the movement within your brain and you're creating it. So I think that, yeah, you have to inhibit your vestibular ocular reflex, but you're not, you're not really damaging it all. You're just choosing a motor pattern where, where that motor pattern's really already overridden it. I think it's fine. I've, I've not seen many uh, big problems with those types of things. Now in martial arts, there are, you know, you, you do a million spin kicks and you're spinning hook kicks. That's all fine. Mm -hmm. But you certainly, if you get into an art where you're punching concrete walls and you're building up calluses and you're, you're kicking trees or things like that, um, you're damaging your, your body. And a lot of times you're, you're okay as long as you keep practicing. But then after a while, when you stop, you know, you, you do pay the prices on those. So the different arts do debt. They have different consequences, particularly arts where you get hurt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in China, they talk about uh, external chi arts chi meaning energy and then internal chi arts and the external chi arts you're hitting things a lot and you're punching things a lot the internal ones like chi gong and things mm -hmm. they're very internal and you learn to control your heart rate and you learn to control your blood flow and you learn to become very aware of organ systems and things and those arts seem to have a better um outcome for your health. Mm -hmm. So uh, Qigong, uh, that's something I'm not 100% familiar with. Um, can you walk us through that again and how that might work uh, from a neurological perspective? Sure. Well, there's different types of um, Qigong. And I think most people might be a little familiar from a yoga perspective, that there's mm -hmm. different types of yoga. There's some types of yoga where you're very still and you don't move. And then there's other types of yoga where you move. So uh, I think one of the classic types of Qigong is there's maybe 12 different positions and you just sit in that position and you don't move. I think most of us are probably familiar when you go to a Chinese restaurant and you see the statue of Buddha. You know, he's got his hands up over his head and his fingers turned in. Mm -hmm. Well, what is up with that? Well, that's actually, a qigong pose and that qigong pose is supposed to be good for you know opening up your arms if you look at it and you think about the way it's stretching your body and your nerves and your blood flow it's also supposed to be really good for your lungs and so that that's a different qigong pose than some of the other ones that are supposed to have different benefits for the organs remember 
in the Chinese medicine, they look at um, your meridian systems. And we have more and more information about those being real. And the different positions are to stretch and move different meridians or associated with different organs. And then you're just sitting there and you're being very, very quiet. I don't know if you've ever tried to stand in one place for an hour, but, and, and then while you're doing it, feel all your breath and all your movement. It's very intense. And interestingly enough, you have to learn to be efficient with your muscle system. And you have to learn to, you know, as you're doing it, your legs will shake. And then eventually you learn how to turn on one muscle group and turn off another muscle group that gives you the, the endurance to not move. Mm -hmm. um, and Qi Gong is big on that. So you get this huge enteroreception, different organ health, and then um, a different type of muscular strength and endurance than say running. Right. And then, um, so I guess the other type, uh, kind of the external, uh, going back to the more external uh, types of martial arts, um, keeping that in mind, I know a lot of times in our clinics, we, we tend to bias certain sides to, you know, affect different axes of the axes of the brain. Uh, do you ever use like martial arts maneuvers as a therapy? Yeah, well, doc, I do. So I guess that's a little, a little bit non-traditional, isn't it? Um, but, but I do, and I do it particularly, um, with kids and with mm -hmm. paralyzed kids. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, this one guy, I would work with him and he was, um, blind. He had had an atrial venous malformation that ruptured mm -hmm. and he had a, a blindness in a certain section and then his arm was paralyzed. I mean, he had been in rehab, uh, 50% of his life or, or, or more if he was, so he was 11, he had probably been in rehab for eight years, nine years. So I'm just another doctor in the road. But what I would do is I would use martial arts training with him and I would motivate him to hold a stick and how to move the stick. And then we would move around and I would use fast movements to try to see if I could get the visual system from his, to go to his colliculus and activate a motor system to respond even though he couldn't cortically see. And then when I saw that he was starting to get this subconscious visual access to function, I started to translate it over where I would just give him something and it was like, could he see the color? And I would move it a little quicker and it was like, was it blue or red or things? And then he actually got to where he could see in there and he got to be able to lift his arm and move his arm and he could hold instruments and tools. I mean, he just did awesome. And so what I did was I integrated everything with my martial arts and then everything with my vestibular rehab and neuro rehab and mm -hmm. oculomotor activities, but I made it fun, yeah. you know, and, 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 and it was fun for me and it was fun for him. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the funniest ones, I remember this one gentleman, he was a mountain climber. He had a very, very bad injury and he, he, uh, ended up in comas and things, but he had literally muscles had tore off his body because the ropes ripped him and he had head injuries. And I worked with him and got his balance better. And then, and then he was getting more stable and he liked to interact with people. And, you know, um, then I had this other kid, he was autistic and he had a hard time with things. And I did martial arts with him. Well, then I had those two work together and train together. So the balance the guy with the balance problem, he was holding the pad and uh, the young autistic kid who needed to do that, he was hitting and, you know, he was learning to move and interact with other humans while the one guy was learning to keep his balance. Um, I had a blast. It's not what I do every day in my mm -hmm. office, right? But I certainly have had a lot of times where I, I, I have enjoyed integrating this. I take every skill set that I have and I try to use it for the individual that um that is there you you have a caps unit don't you oh we use the bird tech now okay but basically yeah yeah that targeting right mm -hmm. so i remember one day i had a a, a ballet dancer mm -hmm. and so for those of you out there dr coppice and i we have these balance plates and we monitor people's balance well 
I put the ballet dancer on there and I modulated it to where it was only moving 1% of her theoretical limit of stability. And then I made the target size really, really big. And I put her on point and I had her on point learn to shift her weight because mm -hmm. she always would ha was too far backward as a ballet dancer and mm -hmm. her partners would have to hold her up. And I did, I, I took the ballet dancing with the uh, force plate and I integrated those two things and I rehabilitated her center of pressure on point, which was just wild. And I fixed it so that, so that she could, uh, she could move better and dance with her partner better. And so, you know, I always like to integrate the sport with tennis players. We go out on the court and do mm -hmm. the therapies. And, uh, you know, I know you're really familiar with going out and doing therapies with the people in the environments, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, it's cool, I have a blast. Yeah, adding that uh, relevance and saliency uh, really helps derive home what you're trying to do and it makes it less mundane for the patient for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, Dr. Ellis, I think we we're just about out of time, but I wanted to make sure to, uh, leave time here at the end in case there was anything that we forgot to discuss or bring up? No, I, I think we kind of did it. I mean, you know, it's just amazing how all the different aspects of life integrate together. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, martial arts is, is great. I recommend it really, really strongly for kids with learning disabilities. And you just got to find the right school where they're going to be patient with your kid. And it's gonna it's gonna help them move a lot. And then for sure, for the elderly to keep their balance moving better, it's a fantastic thing that they can do, uh, either in a group or on their own. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just a wonderful intervention that benefits people. Would there be any um, counter uh, or contraindications for a particular particular elderly person to uh, take up? Tai Chi? Yeah, I mean, they're Tai Chi. Well, you know, if their balance is too bad and they can fall, but the thing is, mm -hmm. if you have a good teacher, you do it in a chair. Mm -hmm. you no, know, you can, the whole thing is, is if the teacher knows how to modify the, the art, it's fine. If the teacher doesn't know how to modify the art, then there are a lot of problems and things. Um, but a true Tai Chi master can do Tai Chi uh, anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, and in any way, I, I, could, I could train a person in Tai Chi if they were bedridden, you know, and just, you know, how do you move your arm correctly or how do you move a finger? You know, you don't get to, maybe you don't get to do the art with your whole body, but you get to still practice it and it still has that Intero reception and benefits and you know movement so yeah I think it's all about the teacher so it sounds to me like uh, really no matter really no matter what age you are or you know what uh, health status you find yourself in there is a, uh, a martial art out there that could benefit you from a neurological perspective and overall health perspective um, which I think is really fast, fascinating and great. Yeah, yeah. Just get get a good teacher, you know. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah. yeah. So um, for anyone listening that uh, is really interested in what you do as a clinician and uh, martial arts, do you teach martial arts? Yeah, yeah, I do. I teach martial arts. Um, how how would they get in touch with you if they were interested in either of those? Sure. Well, from, from the martial arts perspective, I, I teach just a secluded group of students, but um, I really, you know, I owe so much of my life to, to my instructor in martial arts. His name is uh, Jim Sams, and the, there's, he has one school uh, because <laughs> he, he, was a, he was in combat situations and he kind of pledged his life to helping other people in the world. And, and he taught a very, very serious martial art. And so it, it really wasn't commercial. It's mm -hmm. here in Atlanta, Georgia. The website is sajido.com. So S-A-J-I 
do.com or uh, you can look up Jim Sam's martial arts. And so he's great. They're here. They're here in Georgia. I personally will teach there. I teach some select students. Um, and then from a healthcare perspective, I have my office, which is the Georgia Chiropractic Neurology Center. My website is healthybrainnow.com. So healthybrainnow.com. People can uh, write in if, if anyone wants a consult. We always give free consults and things like that. I'm super happy to have a network of physicians, maybe where I can help people find them, like you guys in Chicago. I, I mean, I send patients to you all the time. You guys are really doing a jam up job up there. Um, and then I have my own soft tissue technique. I'm still finishing it. I built some anatomical models and books. I've been teaching it for 20 years, but I'm going to launch it uh, probably pretty soon. It's called Myosynaptics, uh, M Y O synaptics s-y-n-a-p-t-i-c-s uh, i haven't launched that website yet but i will i will sometime uh, we have a facebook page and things and i teach people massage so from my perspective those are the things i do i teach a lot of soft tissue manipulations i teach chiropractic neurology uh, for the carrick institute mm -hmm. professor ted carrick has been a friend and mentor of mine and i think that the two biggest influences for me, I've been Jim Sams to teach me martial arts and then Professor Carrick and Adam Klotzik to teach me brain rehab. Um, but but those are the things. So Saji Do Academy, I love the Carrick Institute. My office is Georgia Chiropractic Neurology Center. And then I'll be launching my soft tissue technique uh, called Myosynaptics. Great. And I, uh, you have that uh, that new brand new, beautiful clinic that I never uh, got to see before I left Atlanta, but it looks gorgeous from the pictures. So oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure your patients really love being there. Yeah, we've been having a blast. And, you know, I moved it over next to Life University mm -hmm. to, to just make it easier to teach. And so because you you would drive all the way across town. Yeah, it was a it was a hike. Yeah. So this one's just seven minutes. And We've, they actually, some of the students just left tonight, so they had a meeting here and they were teaching each other brain rehab while you and I were talking and oh, nice. you know, we're just having a blast down here. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That's what a, what a resource for students. Thank but, you. But uh, thank you again for coming on today, Dr. Ellis. Um, you've been a big influence in my professional career, so I appreciate being able to talk to you. Uh, here on this podcast uh, about something that you are very passionate about. And I think our listeners are going to really uh, love this one. So thank you. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Of course. So this has been your host from the Neuro Wellness Podcast. Be well.